Hello, everybody. Welcome to the talk. Okay, so in this session, we're going to be talking about the real-time analytics stack. Uh, so my name is Mark. I work at a company called StarTree. So let's get started. Um, so I guess the fir first thing we need to do is define what, it, what exactly is the first part of that um, title definition. So what is real-time analytics? So this is how Gartner define it. So they say real-time analytics, the discipline of applying logic and maths to data to provide insights for making better decisions quickly. Okay, that's quite kind of kind of quite abstract. Uh, but the, the, towards the right of the sentence is is what we're interested in. So the idea is that we want to we've got some data, we want to get some insights to do something, like to take some action. Uh, and ideally, we want, yeah we want to do it now rather than say waiting until tomorrow to do it. So let's see how we. How do we how do we make like a more uh, practical uh, definition of that? So I guess you probably have the idea of events. So things that generally happened in the past, and we have a representation of them. So it could be I got on the tram to come, or I got on the train, uh, I got on the plane, I ordered something, I did a search, some something that happened where, which has been which has been captured, and it's like an action from the past. Okay, so the, the events are cool. Like, you'll see lots of talks. Uh, there are lots of tools where you, can, where you can capture these events. And the events on their own are pretty nice. But we are, in this particular context, we want to try and learn something from them. Like, what insight can we, uh, can we get? So you went on the train. Okay, so, so, so what? Uh, you, you did a search for a pizza. Okay, cool. So what are we going to do now? And so that's where we get over to our third thing, which is, so we've got the event. We learned something about it, and now we want to kind of let, like, do something with it. Either I'm, I'm going to do something myself, or we're going to feed it back maybe to the user and try and get them to do something. So, in a couple of th those examples, maybe if I did a search, I mean, you can imagine some of this is probably done already, right? Like, I do a search for pizza. It's like, okay, well, we, we know you want a pizza, so let's put some pizza pizza shops there uh, in, in the in the results of the search or in the in the adverts. If I'm then maybe I'm in the pizza shop. Uh, so we're going to be <laughs> we're going to be using using a pizza example throughout this. So I'll, I'll talk about that quite a bit. Maybe I add an item as uh, so we capture an event. Like, hey, you added this item, and we're like, okay, well, these like here's here's some suggestions for other items that people have been ordering. I don't know in the last hour or so. So we try and put something into the flow that allows people to to make a decision. Okay, so that's that's what we're trying to do. And in this particular stream of analytics, uh, the value of data uh, for us goes down over time. So when the event just happened, that's when it's the most useful for, for us. And it still has some value a little bit after it happens, but it kind of goes down over time. So uh, to take like a more concrete example, imagine that we have an order for something. And so we are, we are kind of capturing the order. And we know all about the order. And then we mess, like, the, I know, let's say we make a mistake with one part of the order. So we've, done, we've made a mistake somewhere. Uh, and if we know about that we made the mistake right now, we can go and do something about, about that, like almost like a, as if we are like, a, like applying data to it to achieve like the service that you get inside a, a restaurant. Whereas if we only find out like later, like say we, we find out tomorrow, we get out, we do our batch analysis and we see, oh, we, we messed up five orders. Like, okay, well, it might be too late uh, to, to make the customer happy again. Uh, and so for real-time analytics, or yeah, I, guess, I guess it would be more soft time, uh, soft real-time analytics, we are sort of living on the left-hand side of this curve. So we want to be looking at data that just happened, or, or maybe, maybe, and maybe like a little bit of time after that. But once we sort of drift towards the right, uh, then, we're, then we're sort of into the, into the world of data warehouse tools, and there are lo lo lots, of, uh, lots of other tools. So we're not going to be focusing on that side of the, of the curve. Um, so the next question might be, okay, so we've got this data, it just happened, so who might be interested in doing something with that data? So there are lots of, uh, lots of potential users. So we could have uh, analysts, and maybe are looking, like rather than, hey, look, I'm going to find out, I'm going to do some analysis tomorrow. Maybe they're doing analysis in the flow, and they can come up with some, uh, some actions that we can do to improve things. Uh, perhaps it's the management, like in an imaginary e-commerce business. Maybe we want to see, like, what's the revenue like looking like now? What does it com how does it compare to, say, this time, like lunchtime yesterday or lunchtime last Tuesday? Can we? Is there any? Is there any change? And if there is a change, uh, can we can we explain what the change is? Is there, is there anything that we can do uh, that we can do about it? And then equally, it could be the users as well. So maybe we the, the users are obviously generating all these events and all this data that we are uh, then analyzing. But can we? then feed it back to them and build like a data product uh, that is useful for the users who were the original creators of the data and then obviously that would probably create some more data and, uh, and create a bit of a a bit of a loop okay so i just want to run you through some examples of applications where uh, where people have built 
things like this already, and I'm, I'm sure there are way more uh, than the ones that I'm going to pick up. Um, so LinkedIn, who viewed your profile, is, uh, is quite a good one, and uh, hopefully, hopefully most of you are reasonably familiar with this, uh, this chart here on, uh, on the left-hand side. So this is the type of thing that you see or you can find on your, on your LinkedIn profile. Profile, and you, or you, you can kind of click through, and it will say, "Hey, here's a chart showing like the interest in you." And then, often on top of it, it will say, "These people looked at you." Sometimes it's kind of annoying, and it says like generically, "Hey, software engineer at big company looked at your profile." And you're like, "Well, that's not that's not useful for, uh, not useful for me. I want to know who it is." Um, and I guess the goal here would be. They want, they want you to interact with those people, right? Like, that's the reason they are putting this in front of you. They're like, hey, here's an, opp I don't know, an opportunity for you or a collaboration that you can do. They're trying to, I guess, they're, part of, partly they're trying to keep you on LinkedIn, but partly they're trying to help you to do, to interact with other people. Uh, and sort of on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see the, 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 the sort of number of queries that they are running per second to generate these charts is quite, is, is quite a lot. And... I guess the thing that, to keep in mind when we're doing this analytics, because it, in a lot of the cases it's to a user on a website or on a phone, the, the query response needs to be quick. If it was all for an analyst somewhere, maybe they'd be quite happy, right? Like they just, I, I can go make a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, I guess, if you're in the UK, and I just, I just wait uh, for 10 or 15 seconds, and I come back and think, okay, cool, I got the result. Uh, you can't do that on a website, right? People will close it and, uh, and go and use another one. Um, so that's, those are some of the, feet, uh, the, the properties that we need to think about. Uh, another one, any newsfeed, pretty much any newsfeed in a social network, they're trying to, I mean, for better or worse for society, they're trying to keep you on there, right? They want to show you stuff that is going to keep you, keep you looking at it. Um, so, this, so LinkedIn is, is one, one such thing, and so there they are trying to put stuff in front of you, ideally for people that you recognize, right? They want to put you, people that you know, uh, if they put just random people, you probably, probably would just scroll past it. So they're trying to like, in real time, who, who's posting stuff, who, which stuff is getting interacted with, and they want, they're trying to satisfy two needs, right? They want that person to be like, cool, I'm getting a lot of inter interaction on my post and lots of people are reading it, great, I'll, maybe I'll post another one. Uh, and then from, from the other side, they're like, okay, here's people who are in your network that you might be interested in. So there's sort of, the action there is, well, they want you to, to like something or comment on it, and then they also want people to post more stuff. Uh, another one, um, so like the talent pool reports so are here where, where sort of there's, a, I guess it's a, a narrower set of people. So this is part of the, the LinkedIn premium for recruiters. And so they can see like, sort of real time what is happening, what people are available, looking for, looking for, looking for jobs, uh, where, where, in which part of the world is that, uh, what skills and who's, who's employing uh, people so they can kind of try, try and, in, I say, I got to say, they can, in, they can try and direct people uh, to, those, uh, to those companies. And then, okay, let's do one more. So Uber Eats. So uh, this is very, I guess, very similar. DoorDash or Just Eats or Deliveroo is, is a big one in the UK. So any food delivery shop. So this one is Uber Eats and they have this thing called the uh, restaurant manager. And so each uh, person who has a restaurant in there on, on Uber Eats will get this dashboard. And you can see it shows some of the things that we've been talking about. So you can kind of see like, hey, here's, here's my revenue and here's how it was. What do they do in the last 12 weeks versus the previous 12 weeks? So the management will be like, okay, cool. We are, well, it's kind of, actually, it's gone down. So they might be nice. It's not cool. So it's gone down by $800, $800 in, that, in that time period. Uh, more interesting for maybe for the operations team who are running the, the restaurant is over on this right-hand side, numbers three and five. So they're like, hey, we've made, we've missed an order or we've got an inaccurate order. So that, that if we leave it like that, then those customers are not going to be very happy, right? They're going to receive uh, like a rock, like either they're going to be missing something or maybe they're going to get the wrong product and then they're going to be like, I'm not going to use Uber Eats anymore. I'm going to use, I'm going to use Deliveroo instead. So like knowing this stuff as it's happening can be actually useful for them. So this one's probably the best one in terms of um, like being able to take some action as a result of it. And then I guess like one more would be if they're getting real-time feedback on the menu, maybe they can see like, hey, we've got some ingredient, like some, I don't know, we've put a bad ingredient in one of the, in one of the things. We can see like lots of, lots of complaints on, uh, on one item and let's maybe stop, uh, stop using that one today and we'll, we'll, we'll investigate it later. Uh, and again, like the, the, for this particular dashboard, the number of users is going to be less, right? It's only going to be the people operating the restaurant and, um, and the, and the people, yeah, the people who work, who, who, who like work in that team. So the number of queries per second is less, but maybe there are more, uh, more users um, doing it. And again, they want to, yeah, in this case, they want to see like as it's happening. And I guess for peak, uh, for, they want it to be able to handle, hey, in the peak period of time, I guess in the evenings, like I, I want to be able to see exactly what's happening. Okay, so some examples. So that's, the, that's, that's sort of what the, the, 
the talk is about, like building these type of, of things. Uh, so I want to give you a map of the types of tools that people use uh, to build these. So this is probably the most, yeah, like if you were choosing to remember one part of the talk, this next bit is probably the, uh, the bit. And the idea is that I want to give you a map. So when you see like, hey, here's a brand new tool, you can go and it does real-time analytics. You can go, okay, it fits here in the, in the map. So here is the map. So if we come from the right-hand side, so imagine we've got our users down here. So our users are using something, and they are generally not using any of these things, right? They are not using any of these tools. Those are hidden away somewhere. All they will be interacting with is some sort of front-end. Like, and the front end that they use will depend on who they are. Like if they are uh, an external user to a company, then maybe it's going to be a completely different UI, UI, uh, front end to if they are an analyst working inside a company. And then, uh, so if we come back, they then they send some sort of serving layer. So where the data is served from, I'm going to go through each of these. So I'll just do a quick, quick uh, explanation here. We've then got the, the streaming platform where all those events that we talked about right at the beginning, those are in there. We've got potentially a stream processor operating on there and doing something with the events. And then all the way at the beginning, uh, we've got the production of the events. And that's where we're going we're gonna to break it down. So event producers. So what, what are these? So I mean, I guess it's, it's sort of in the name, right? So they are generating the events that are going to be used to do something. So one one. one Origin of events is our existing databases. So maybe we have some existing relational databases often. It, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be relational, but some existing databases that have data that we'd like to use. And there are lots of tools called change, you know, change data capture tools that can capture data from these databases and then pass it down downstream where we can do some analysis on it. And generally, you wouldn't necessarily maybe only be using the data from that database on its own. You could, but often people are then joining that with some data from somewhere else. So we'll look at that in a minute. But that's one source of data. So it could be our Postgres database, our Mongo database, our MySQL database, like some, some sort of database. And, and we're generating a, a change log of what's happening in that database. So that's one uh, type of event. Another one would be event trackers. So it could be like we're using Segment or maybe Snowplow or maybe even Google Analytics and we're capturing like what are people doing on the page? They, I don't know, like something like I clicked a link on a page. I went to a page. Maybe it also captures how long you spent on there. Potentially it even captures like which bit of the page did you look like? There's like lots of uh, potential events that can be like just in the, the navigation of, um, of a mobile app or a website. And then finally, the most g generic one, and I guess a lot of events probably come from here, and if we want flexibility and control over the generation of the events, we, can, we have, often have some sort of producer uh, that we can use that we can generate the events ourselves. And there we can just, I mean, if we, so for example, in this talk, we'll be creating made up events. We'll just generate like a load of events ourselves, and we can do that using one of the SDA, SD clients for the streaming platform. And the majority of the streaming platforms, they, they have Java, Python, Go, Node, whichever one you use, there's likely one available. And if they don't have a specific one for the language, there tends to be some sort of HTTP API that you can use instead. Okay, so that's the event producers. The events are then coming into the middle, into our streaming platform. So what's a streaming platform? So the idea here is that we're ingesting data from, from some sources in a scalable way. And then the most important thing is we're storing them, um, storing them durably. And the general uh, abstraction is a topic. So a topic would be a type of event. So it could be the orders, the products, the users, uh, the trips. Like what, like, uh, I, way I like to think of it is like, what would, be the, uh, what would be the name of a table capturing some data? That will probably be likely the same name as, as what it is in the stream. And you can have lots of, the, lots of, different, uh, lots of different topics. Um, to capture the different data. So yeah, you, know, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily be putting, putting all the data in, in one place. You'd split it out depending on what, what exactly it represents. And then those events are then being stored into a potentially infinite log. Um, so effectively just adding them on. Right? Imagine we've got like an infinite list of things and we're just putting them, uh, putting them on the end. It'll likely be partitioned across multiple servers um, so, that we can, so that we can produce events in parallel and so that we can consume them as well. And then also if, if, if one of the servers goes down, hey, we've still got a copy of it uh, over here. And so they generally, like, imagine this is a view of a Kafka topic partition. It might look like this. So we've got like one, the records, they're added starting from the left are the older ones and kind of coming over to the right, we have the newer ones. And we're always sort of adding them uh, on the end. And then, like, so if you were building something like this, 
like the, the logical way of thinking of, of it is like an infinite list of stuff, but at some point you're probably going to truncate it, or maybe you're going to try and compress it. Um, so d in theory, it's infinite. In, in probability, I guess people are, I, people are usually keeping it around for, like I say, maybe a few days or a week, um, the, the data in these, uh, in these logs. And there are many choices of tools in here. Uh, by the way, this is not even the biggest uh, technology choice slide, but there are lots of them. So, uh, so Kafka is, 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 is quite, a, quite a common one that people are using here. Um, more, yeah, I guess more recent ones, so there's Pulsar, there's Red Panda. Uh, some of them are like maybe not exactly the, the same. So you have like Ably, uh, Google PubSub, Kinesis. So they all have some slightly different features. I guess if you were using one particular cloud platform, maybe you're going to lean towards using the one that is on there. But at some level, like they are all achieving like some high-level goal, which is I can produce some events in there, and then I can I can get them out again. And they have, I guess, they have varying like ease of use, and e I guess depending on the familiarity you have with uh, with the tools and uh, all the tricks to use them. So I don't, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know which one is the best, but there are there are many uh, that you can choose from. So that takes us over to the stream processor uh, world. So these are um, tools that can operate on the events coming in. Uh, and it's potentially they are operating on like multiple. So they could be, in, in this example, it shows, hey, there's an input topic of some data. It could be more than one. So they could be processing data from two different topics at the same time. They then do something to the data. So it could be they are joining some streams of data together. Maybe they are creating a materialized view and then they are, they are ca calculating the updates. Maybe they're doing streaming ETL. Maybe they're doing some sort of temporal operation. So maybe they're calculating... Uh, and then, hey, calculate me the revenue that's happened for each I know, for each product, and then pass that on to another uh, another stream. But generally, they like at a high level, they are taking some data in from some sources, and in, in, in this in our I guess in our example, it, the source is going to be some sort of streaming platform. But a lot of them, they you can kind of feed it in from other sources as well. So if you wanted to pass it in from a relational database, you could do that. But for our sake, let's say it's some sort of streaming platform, and then they're going to put the data out. So to, and you will often see this referred to as, hey, we're going to put it out to a sync. In this case, we're saying the sync is uh, the event streaming platform, but it doesn't have to be, right? You could be working with a stream processor and put the data straight out um, to, uh, to somewhere else. You don't necessarily have to feed it back into the streaming platform. Okay, and then, the, so yeah, like the, the, there are lots of different things that people use, or like where the, where the data goes. It could be we're doing streaming analytics, so maybe we're, we're doing some sort of window operation. So that would be like, hey, find a period of time and do some sort of aggregation in that time and then pass the, pass the results on. Perhaps instead we're, doing, we're building like some event-driven microservices. So we're getting the events and then we're sending them off to the microservice that is responsible for them. And then for our particular case, we're interested in um, doing sort of streaming, streaming ETL. So can we do some joins? Can we do some filtering or transforming uh, of the data in the stream? And then uh, I guess there, there are other use cases as well. So if the, uh, the data was partitioned by the wrong key, we could go and fix that in the, in, in the stream processor and then, and then pass the data on. There are many, uh, as I was saying, there are lots of different ones here. So um, the, I guess the, the most commonly known ones are, I suppose, Kafka Streams, uh, KSQL DB, Flink, but there are, you often see, like, there, are loads of, there are loads of these new ones being, being introduced all the time. So more recent, I guess, Quix is sort of last c couple of years. That one is a sort of Python, um, Python SAS service type thing. Memgraph is a, a graph processing one, so they allow you to run like graph algorithms on top of, uh, on top of streaming data. Sometimes, you, like, for example, with Materialize, you see ones where they are doing a little bit of two things. So uh, Materialize almost drifts to be, between being a stream processor and doing some of the stuff that we'll see in the, in the serving layer. And equally, you sometimes see that the tools that we saw in this, uh, the streaming platform, so for example, Pulsar, has some features that you might see in a stream processor. So for example, in Pulsar, you can apply functions over a stream and write it into another stream. Like just, I guess it's not a replacement for one of these, but there is some overlap. So they don't necessarily cleanly fit into one of the categories. Sometimes they, they take like some features from, uh, from one or the other, but I guess they are. And um, certainly on the stream processor database, you'll see like lots of ones framing themselves as a streaming database. And you're like, okay, so which one? <laughs> which one are you? They're almost like doing two things, right? They can do some stream processing and they also store the data as well. So 
Um, it would definitely be interesting if you did this. Yeah, if you did this map again in a year's time, what is it? What does it look like now? Is there now like some more uh, some more blurred uh, categories? Okay, so we've seen three things. So we produced the events, we put them into a streaming platform, and then we potentially did some processing of the events in that streaming platform. Now we want to figure out, okay, how are we going to get the data to our front end? So we need some way to, to query it. Uh, and generally, you don't query it directly in the streaming platform or in the stream processor. You normally put it somewhere. And that somewhere, we're naming it the, the serving layer, but it will usually be a database of some sort. And so it kind of fits in here. So it will generally be in, in, integrated directly with the streaming platform, but not again, it's, it's kind of blurry. Like sometimes some of them will allow you to create data from the stream processor in the serving layer. But let's say for simplicity's sake, generally, like 90% of the time, we are consuming the data that's coming from a streaming platform of some, some sort. And there are some properties that we would expect to have. On, on, on whatever tool we choose to use here. So since we're going to be, like, as we, we've been talking, we want to be able to query this, the, like, the latest data, we need to be able to get the data from the streaming platform into whatever tool we use here very, very quickly. So we shouldn't, it should be able to like, get the data off uh, or consume the data from the streaming platform very quickly. Right? That's, the, that's, 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 one, that's one feature. And then once we've got it, we need to be able to query it uh, and the way I th like very quickly as well, and so I th the way I think of this is that we we're doing we want to get OLTP query speeds on OLAP data. So we've got like lots and lots of data, probably like doing queries covering way more records than we normally would in an OLTP um, database. And so we want to be able to query those while not impacting the the ingestion. So the data should still be coming in, and we want to be querying it. And we would expect that if we ran the query again, the the result will be will be updated. So we'll see like a slightly different result. So in our Imaginary example where we've been saying, hey, we've got uh, pizza or like orders coming in. If we ran it and said, hey, how much revenue have we made in the last one hour? Uh, let's say we started it less than an hour ago. If we run it again, we should see a different number. So it's always going to be picking up the latest events that have been processed. Uh, and then finally, like we saw in some of the examples at the beginning, as well as achieving those two uh, criteria, we want to be able to do this at scale. So we want to be able to sort of scale it out uh, and have either lots of people uh, or users submitting those queries, or, potential, or if, it, if it's not necessarily lots of users, maybe the, the users are, there are less users, but the page is sending out lots of queries. So altogether, they need to be able to handle us doing yeah, hundreds of thousands of queries per second against these tools. And they, I mean, it's, in, our, in what we'll do our example on, it's going to be on one machine, but you would expect like these, they, they should be able to scale out to be able to have multiple machines serving it. And then finally, they usually have some sort of way of doing um, complex queries, maybe doing joins, aggregations, and filtering on, on large sets of data. Like that's, the, that's the goal that we want here. And so when we're choosing, uh, this one has kind of a, clean, like a cleaner way of, like a way of how, working out uh, how to make the decision. So if you're doing, let's say that really all we want to do is we wanna, we're going to do key-based querying, and we don't really care about like, the flexibility of what, what we do with the data once it's here. Like, for example, let's say the only thing we want to do is we want to know for each product, tell me how many of them we sold and what revenue did we make. Now, let's say we had that. Then we can perfectly easily uh, put the data into a key value store or a NoSQL database of some sorts, so Mongo, Redis, whichever one there. You could probably put Postgres in here as well. And we could do our analysis on there. If we want more flexibility, over it, and I guess more features designed for working with this type of data, then we drift over um, to wanting to pick uh, a real-time yeah, database that I guess is more designed for this. And I suppose like advantages they would have over this side is that, yeah, this is their, their thing. Uh, the, these tools over here would, like for example, on the left, if we wanted to change a row of data, we can probably go and do it. On the ones on the right, they are assuming like you're not going to be going and changing a row. Like you're going to load in a bunch of data, and if you want to, and, and you wouldn't be wouldn't be changing data at a row level. And these ones on the right hand side are generally storing data in columns, and they are assuming that the queries that you're doing are, hey, select a column, do some sort of group by that column, and then count some stuff or sum some stuff or whatever or average some stuff. Right? That you're doing uh, aggregation uh, queries, and generally not doing, hey, let's select star from everything. Uh, so that, that's sort of the, the distinction between the two in my, in my head. And you can see there are, there are some different tools. So we're going to be looking at Apache Pinot, but there are also Druid, ClickHouse, Rockset. Uh, there are some other ones which sort of blur the, blur the boundaries. So we talked about Materialize that is sometimes used. Um, I'm trying to think. There, there are some other ones as well, which I can't remember off the top of my head. If I, if I remember, I'll, I'll, re I'll reference them again later. 
Okay, so that's right. So we've got the data, right? So we've seen the data, we've got it in the platform, we've processed it potentially with the stream processor, and we've put it into a database. So now we've got a front end. And here, like, the choice is, is almost infinite what you can do. But I think there's kind of three ways that you can choose your tool. So if you're building a user facing, like, external user facing tool, it probably needs to be using some sort of custom UI that your engineering team is going gonna, is gonna to build. And you can obviously take your pick uh, of how you do it. Often people are building single page applications so that they can get the kind of uh, interactivity that these applications usually have. And it, I don't know which one is the best out of here. I'm most familiar with React, but there are definitely other ones newer than this that people prefer. Uh, but it basically custom built, yeah, pick your tool. There's obviously you're going to do more coding, but you have complete control over what happens there. So that's, that's fine. If we come over to the middle, and this is more like these, I guess, drift towards more being, hey, if we're building it for an internal uh, audience where we're quite happy to, for it not to be maybe as, uh, maybe not to be as polished as what you can do if you do it yourself and maybe you have less control uh, over what the result looks like, you could look at a low code framework. And there are, again, loads of these. Uh, I was trying to, yeah, it's hard to work out what the most popular ones are, but Streamlit and uh, Plotly Dash seem to be um, two ones that, that two of the ones that people are people are using a lot. So those are those are good ones. And then coming even further, we might be using just a purely data visualization tool. And here maybe we are not writing any code uh, at all. Maybe we are we are clicking on some like it's got the UI. We got some fields. We go and click those fields, and it goes, hey, here's a here's a line chart showing the orders as they're coming in. And so we don't have, we we can we load in our maybe we load in our schema for our serving layer, and then it sort of takes care of the rest for us. And there are some other ones on there as well. Um, so Metabase, I think Metabase, maybe you have to pay for it, and then Superset, there is an open source version of that one as well. Uh, okay, so I want to show you for the rest of the time a demo of how you would glue these, um, these tools together. So this is my imaginary pizza shop, uh, all about that day. I'll, I'll give you a link in a minute if you want to have a look at it. So this is, this is a... Um, a demo that we <coughs> that we created. Uh, this is where it lives. So I'm going to open it in a minute. So let's have a look. So this is this is our imaginary pizza shop. Um, zoom it in. So you can kind of see it sort of explains. Hey, it's a, a it, we have a, a pizza shop. We want to build a uh, build them a, a dashboard on top of it. This is what it's going to look like. And it kind of, if you, want to, if you want to follow this yourself afterwards, you can kind of look through and it explains how does everything work, what data have we got, where is the data, how do we go about putting it into the database, and how do we go about querying it. But in, yeah, I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm going to walk through that like, a, like that in, the, in, the, in this talk. So, but if you want to look at it afterwards, it is available as well. Okay, so let's have a look. So we've got our imaginary pizza shop. And let's say they have, so this, this pizza shop has, so, some existing architecture. So we're going to say, we're going to imagine they are already loading some data into Kafka. Uh, and let's say they are using that somewhere else uh, for their business. Maybe they're doing you know, handling all the processing using the events coming off here. But they're not really doing any analysis on the data at the moment. And alongside that sort of order service stream over here, they also have some users and some products in MySQL. And so what we're going to do is we're going to add in this bit of architecture that's in the red, the sort of red dotted rectangle. So we're going to, uh, we're going to get the orders. We're going to put the orders into Apache Pino up here. And then we're going to build a little dashboard on top of it. Um, so we can see like, what, how, mu yeah, how, mu how many orders are coming in, what revenue are we making, or what are the orders themselves. So that'll be the first part. And then the second part will be, okay, can we then join it with these products? So we're going to use a stream processor here. So we're going to use Kafka Streams to join the products with the orders. Um, to, and we're going to also split out or the, the orders to get the items that are hidden inside the order. And then we're going to get the, we're going to call it the enriched order items. And again, we'll, we'll visualize that. So no, oh, not done yet. So if I come over uh, to here. So I've got some, so let's just have a quick look what's in our MySQL. So if I come here. So this is, uh, this is all running in Docker, if you want to try it out locally, and we can say, hey, use pizza shop, and we can have a look. So we've got, oh, forget the comment. So we've got some tables, right? So we've got the users, and we've got the products. So we can have a look at the products. Uh, maybe we'll put a limit on it to make it a bit easier. So limit three. So we've got some products. So we've got, oh, by, oh, by the way, I should say, these products are taken from the Domino's India uh, 
menu. Uh, so if there are some extremely unusual pizza toppings, uh, this is the reason for it. So we've got the Moroccan spice pasta pizza. As any Italians, there was some Italian, uh, the last time I did the talk, someone in Italian was like, that's unacceptable, that's unacceptable pizza toppings. Uh, but we can kind of have a look. So they've got... Can you run the query and replace the semicolon with backslash capital G? Back, where here? Like G. G, like that? Ah, oh, that's cool. Oh, I didn't know that. Ah, oh, there we go. That's a bit easier to read. Let's put, let's put more records then so we can have a look and see some of the cool pizza. I mean, some of them sound quite cool, like the red, red velvet lava cake. We've got the paneer. I mean, what is cool is that you can actually take these ones and have a look what they look like as well. So we can, we can always copy one. Let's see. There you go. <laughs> there is there is a better one. There is I'm trying to see. There's a bur where's the burger one? There's a burger pizza somewhere. What's that? Like a taco? Is that like a I thought it's a taco oh, it is a taco. Is that a pizza? No, that can't be a pizza, surely. A roasted wings. Hang on, let's see. So if we put if we take off the limit, let's see what it, what are the other ones. We've got the chicken parcel, the lava cake. I really want to show you the burger pizza. It's brilliant. Where is it? Yeah? Oh, here we go. Here's the burger pizza. Do you have one of these? Hang on, let's see if it, this looks like what you expect. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have that? No, the Swedish one is a burger with fries inside the cassone. Ah, okay, not like this. But yeah, this, this is what they call the burger pizza. <laughs> so anyway, so yeah, we've got, some, we've got some products and we've got some users as well. Hang on, let's have a look. That is a cool trick. I didn't know the, uh, the minus G. That's nice. Oh, there we go. So we've got some users as well. Okay, so that's fine. So that's our first bit. Right, let's go out. Of, let's exit from here. Right, the other thing is we've got a... I'll quickly show you. So we've got this... So to get the orders into Kafka, we've got this order generator, which I'm not sure whether this is going to be... Maybe the font size is too big. But it's literally... It's, it's re, I say it's, it's not a super sophisticated uh, order generator is, re is reasonably <clears throat> reasonably basic in some ways but effectively we are using the like some of this data is generated by the, the faker library maybe you've seen that it attempts to to generate like re re reasonably realistic looking data so all the users were generated from here and the addresses and so on and so we've got so we've kind of got like our kafka connection string we've got a mysql connection string and then we are we've got like a a loop here, so I know this wraps onto the onto the next line. So we we got sort of grab the the products. This here, we are writing the products into Kafka as well. This is purely to simplify the demo. If you were doing this in real life, probably you use some sort of CDC tool to put it to put it there, like Debezium or, or whichever one you choose to use. Uh, you can see we are grab this is we are grabbing the users. Uh, we have the what's that grabbing the pizza the, the idea of the product and the price, and then. We are doing some extremely simple uh, random generation. So we're like, hey, create a number of items in the order. So one to 10, loop through that. And then for each item, choose one to five, uh, how many should be, there should be. If you were doing a more sophisticated version, I guess you would want to like do it on the category so that we are not ordering like I don't know, 10 pizza, 10 different types of pizza in the same order, but rather, hey, I'm going to buy one main and one side and one drink, but yeah, I'm not haven't got like quite that sophisticated yet, but then it generates, creates some events. Uh, we put like a status for the event. We post it to the orders topic. Okay, so that's that's basically all it does. And then we can we can. There's a nice tool. Maybe you've seen it before. Uh, if you are using Kafka from the command line, called kcat, and so you can effectively just cat on a on a stream of stuff. So for example, we can go kcat, and it be in consumer mode. Local host, I think it's 29092, and then my topic is orders, and let's say one. Yeah, so we get one event. Let's just put it into J. Oh, that's now that's, that's a bit, maybe there's another, hang on, let's see if we can find another one. No, these are all, oh, yeah, it's kind of a bit <laughs> scrolling more than I hoped. Anyway, there you go. So that's what an event looks like. So you see it's got an ID that is a generated duet. We've got a creation date, which is... I guess my, I don't know why, I don't know why. My computer's always putting it in GMT. Maybe it's still in GMT. I'm not sure. Anyway, there's the UK time. Wait, it tells us which user placed the order. The total price of all of these items and then the individual uh, 
items within the order, how many we bought, and what was the unit price for each of them. And then it, it adds them all up, puts it at the top. And yeah, so that's what the events look like. And if I would take off the... Uh, should that keep... Oh, it should keep going on, let's see. Yeah, so it will. It has many events sort of coming through. Okay, so those are the events. And so what we want to do now, because we can kind of see, we've done the first bit. So we've, got the, we've, got, we've generated some orders. We've looked at MySQL. We've got those two bits. So that was like our starting point. What we want to do now is put that data into Pino so that we can, we can go about querying it. So Pino like, has the abstraction of a table on top of data. So you can put it, like, almost consider it like a dynamic table on top of a, a, a stream. So the, it will always be updating the data as it's coming in. And so, oh, sorry, I should have put the less there as well. So the first thing for it doesn't have, uh, I guess, yeah, in, in, in MySQL or Postgres, you can create the, the table using SQL. It doesn't have that at the moment, but instead you can specify a, a schema using this JSON structure. The naming of stuff is often copying what you will see with data warehouses. So for example, we say, hey, I've got some dimension fields. The, there's not really anything special about them other than, the, other than that the query optimizer will use whichever one, uh, whichever type you, you use as part of it optimizing its query. So for example, it will expect that fields in, in dimensions are going to be the ones where you are filtering on them or you are grouping by them, uh, whereas metrics, you are likely going to be summing them or counting them. Okay, so we've got uh, the ID, the user ID, the product ID, the status, quantity, quantity and double. Uh, now, the way that it maps these are that whatever column it sees, it will map it directly to whatever is in the... Uh, is in the data source. So in this case, the orders is going to be the order stream. So ID and user ID and product ID and status are all in there. You'll notice that quantity and double are not, right? So those are some extra fields. So if you have those, by default, those will be null, unless you do uh, add a, a function that, that, tells, that does some sort of computation for those extra fields. So we're going to have a look at that in a second. And then finally, we have um, the date time field. So this is TS. And notice TS is, is not the name that we have in, in the um, in the source, so we're going to have to fix that as well. So let's come in here, and I'm going to start from the end. So you can do these, uh, you can sort of do these uh, transformations. So in this case, we are saying, hey, find me the um, work, like, can, can you convert the, the, the time uh, into, the, into a different, yeah, into an into a epoch milliseconds from the date time string that you had before? I thought I had one other thing in here, uh, maybe not. And then if we, let's have a look at the other stuff first, and I'll come back to that. We then specify the table name. The table name and the schema name need to be the same. There's like kind of a, a link between them. And then we say it's a real-time table. So that means, if you say real-time, it means, hey, you, I'm, I'm expecting some sort of streaming config somewhere so that I, I know. And it can be, in this case, Kafka, but you can, you can use other ones as well. So you could put Pulsar, you could put um, Google Pubs up, whichever one you are, you are using, you can put it there. There is also the concept of what they, call, what they call an offline table. And so that would be like, say, I don't know, say we had the orders from last week and we decided, hey, I want to load those ones in. Maybe we don't want to load, go and load those in from a stream. Maybe instead we have those in an S3 bucket somewhere. So we could choose to, to load those in. Uh, if it's an offline table, it is assuming that you are just going to do like a one-off like ingestion of that data. And then it will actually allow you to load those into a table of the same name. And so then when you query it, it will, it will sort of almost be querying two, ta two, two, datas, or, you know, two types of data at the same time. So one is the sort of data that's updating all the time, and one is sort of the static data over here. But you, from the query point of view, you don't even see the difference, right? It's just like, oh, there's some data there. When you specify, so the way that the data comes in um, to Pino, so we don't, there's not really the, in here, there's not the concept of going, hey, I want to insert in, in some, some records. Uh, for real-time data, you basically got to configure it in the table. When you create the table, you configure like, hey, where is the data coming from? So we say it's coming from Kafka. Uh, low level means that it's going to create one consumer thread per partition in Kafka, although I think here we've got just one partition anyway, so it doesn't, it doesn't make a difference. Then we specify the name of the topic, the, where the broker lives, and then finally, uh, we, this is uh, yeah. This bit here is saying um, so. What so Pino has its unit of storage is a segment. So a segment is all the columns, but a subset of the rows. So it kind of creates like these, and it sort of takes care of takes care of working out. Okay, when is one segment completed? And I'm going to go on to the next one. Um, so that's what that is. Okay. I think I've yeah. So I think I've already. I already have this. I already have this done. So let's have a look. So here we have um, an orders 
table. So if we scroll down, you can kind of see, see what it has in it. So you see we've got an ID, we've got some items, uh, we've got a price, products ordered, status, total quantity, timestamp, and user ID. And you can sort of, so you can do most SQL stuff. I'd say like at the moment, restricted in, the, in this particular version of the query planner, you can't do, you can't do like normal joins uh, on this one, but there is like a, a beta planner where you can, uh, where you can do that. So, so that's a, a limitation for the moment. Uh, but let's say, I don't know, we could do, hey, can't we do number of orders that have happened since we've been, been, <laughs> been, been, thanks, uh, since we started the talk. So we've got 51,000 orders. We could then sum up the total revenue that we've made. So we've made, uh, this is in rupees. So the number is very, very big. Uh, so we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, so 227 million uh, rupees. I probably should have converted it like into euros or, or into, into kroner or something, but I don't know. It was it was it was easier to just keep, just, just leave everything uh, as it was. Okay, so and, and we could obviously do more queries on here if we wanted to. We could find out. I don't know. Let, let's do one more. So say, uh, what else can we do? I don't know. Let's see if there's any users who are ordering multiple times. There must be, right? We we don't have an we don't have a unlimited number of users. Wow, number user twenty. Hang on. Well, let's order it first. Order by. User 129 has ordered 33 times, 31 times. We probably need more users, but you can kind of, you kind of got the idea. So we can, and we can sort of do that in here. And if this was for like people who are familiar with SQL, maybe it would be fine to just build a little UI or maybe even give them this UI and go, hey, you can work out everything uh, using this UI. Um, if, but let's say they are not, they are not, they, are, they don't want to, <laughs> they want to write any SQL. They want to just say, show me something, um, something nice. So maybe then instead, we can build them something. So this is in this is using Streamlet. So I'll show you how this works in a minute. But effectively, this is an auto refreshing dashboard. Uh, so you should it refreshes every couple of seconds. So we could make it more frequent, so every one second. And you can see it's kind of capturing the number of orders. It's what it's more or less a thousand every minute. And then the revenue, or the revenue. I guess the revenue is a bit a little bit more variable depending on which orders are random. Order generator has come up with, and then down the bottom you can see the uh, the orders uh, refreshing. So if I, I'll just show you how we sort of glue this together. So we're do, this is all, so Streamlit, in case you've not seen it, is a Python, it's, I don't know what you would call it, like maybe, a, I don't know if you'd call it a Python web framework, but effectively it's a tool that allows you to like kind of write scripts and they give you lots of different kind of controls. So they have sort of, uh, oh, actually, where is, is maybe under docs? So I can show you what you have. Uh, this is not, I'm not very good at navigating this. Let's try that. So they have this API. So for example, they have some widgets, they have buttons, they have radio buttons, sliders. Um, and then they integrate with most, like lots of other Python libraries as well. So for example, on our one, we are using the Plotly charting, we're using a pandas table. And so it's then constructing everything for us. And then at the top, what you saw is what they call a, it should be called a metric, where is it? I don't know what it, which one it comes under, maybe this one. Now oh, here we go. So they have this concept of the metric. So this is the idea that I want to show some sort of data in a, yeah, kind of in a nice, like, like, like view, like a big, a big number at the top. Um, so basically you write everything in Python and it almost looks like it's generating some sort of single page application for you. Okay, so let's just come back. So I just explained to you how we glued everything together. So we are, we are doing everything, like all these queries are going through the Pino uh, Python SDK. So we, I'll just let's let's run a query so we can have a look. So if we come over, so this is a Python console. So we can kind of load this stuff in. This query here is the one that that populates what you see at the top. So what it's doing is a so it's doing a, an aggregation plus filtering query. So we kind of start with only get me the data in the last two minutes, and then we're sort of simulating. You know that. Um, Uber Eats dashboard where it was like, hey, here's the orders this week versus here's the orders last week. So we're doing it for one minute and two minutes ago. And so it's saying, hey, get me in that two minutes, find me just what happened in the last one minute, and then get me what happened in the minute before, and then do the same for the revenue that we made. Okay, so that's the query. And at the, at the right, so if we paste that in, so we've got that query, and then let's uh, let's run it. And so this is what it looks like. This is kind. Of, this is that's what the the source of the data looks like. So it's like in this case, 987 events in the last minute, 986 in the minute before. The revenue is what is it? Four million. 
4 million and 4.33 million and 4.46 million. Okay, and then we, we're putting that into a dashboard. So I'll just show you what that looks like as well. Um, so you see, like at the top, um, we've kind of got the same sort of code. The extra stuff that we're doing is Streamlit. So Streamlit generally, the way it works is it runs a loop that goes for, or that comes from the top of the page all the way to the end, and then it stops. If you then change something in your code, it goes back to the top of the loop again and runs it again. So when you're developing it, if you're changing stuff, it automatically kind of picks it up. Uh, if you're finished, like I'm kind of finished, it obviously doesn't do that anymore. And so what we have to do is if we come down to the bottom, we can, it has this thing which is in their experimental tier, like they have different tiers of the API called experimental rerun. And so we are forcing it to go back to the top again. So that's what it does. So we're saying every, and so number is like a number of seconds. So where do we have it? Uh, number. So yeah, we are setting that refresh rate is number, and then it goes, sleeps for that second, and then it goes back to the beginning. So we are sort of simulating the, the, the refresh. And then, yeah, let me just show you one more thing. So this is the, the metrics. So this is, how we are, this is how we are building that metrics stuff. So we're basically saying, hey, I want to build a metric. Here's my first value. So events one, and then I do events one minus events two to get the, the delta. Okay, so that's our first dashboard. And then the next thing that we want to do is join the products with the orders. So remember, we, we kind of cheated and we put the products. So the products are in here. As I say, if you were doing this for real, like use, use, a, use the change data capture tool to do that. And then we're going we're gonna to use Kafka streams to combine them together. But again, you can pick your, pick your stream processing tool. This is using a Java framework called Quarkus, uh, which has quite a nice integration with Kafka streams. Uh, and effectively, what we're doing is we're saying, hey, I've got an order stream. I've got, oh, wait, hang on. I've got an order stream down here. I've got an order stream. So that means it's going to treat everything as a, as a new entry. I've got a products, they call it a K table. And so there it's going to be, OK, it's going to look at the key for that stream, and then it's only going to pick up the latest thing. So for example, I mean, for us, we have only each product is there one time. If we were to do an update to the product and we put it into the stream, it's going to pick up the latest uh, entry for that product. Then what we do next is we are f doing a flat map. So flat map is, yeah, when, when, like a map would be, hey, I've got an item, do something to it, give me another item. Flat map would be, I've got an item, I'm going to do something that gives you multiple items. I want you to kind of explode those out so that I get like a big list of items. So we want to get all the order items in a big uh, stream. So that's what that bit does. And then finally, we, uh, we join them together. So we're just saying, hey, take the order items, join them with the products. Um, because we don't specify a foreign key join anywhere here, it's assuming that the keys on the two streams are the same. So i.e. they are both using product ID. OK, and so if we run that app, that app is already running in the background. And what it does is it populates this thing called the enriched order items. And so this is what it looks like when we join them together. So we've got the order ID, we've got a created app, and we've got the product, and then we've got the order item. You could choose to flatten that if you wanted. I, I, I figured it was easier just so we could see both of them together. And then we... We then put that into Pinot as well. I realize I've got like two minutes left, so I'm just going to show you what it looks like. So we've got this table. Uh, we've got everything in here. So you see we've got the order item. We've got the order item. Uh, oh, sorry, order quantity. We've got the category, the product ID, the product name, and so on. And then we can go and add in a new a, like a sort of updated dashboard that pulls in the most uh, popular items and then the most popular categories. So if we wanted to see like, hey, is there a surge of demand for one of the products? We would be able to see it. Now, obviously, like since I showed you, this is a very, very basic simulator. That's never going to happen. But we should like, yeah, we could build like a long tail type simulator where it's like really biasing towards uh, some products. And then we might see like, hey, look, suddenly there's a, the four cheese pizza has got like crazy number of uh, orders. This is quite cool. I mean, I guess this is okay because this is just after lunch, so you're not hungry. I guess this would be a bad one to bad demo to do just before lunch. But but yeah, so hopefully you can kind of see we've joined like we joined a few tools together and we can build quite a uh, quite a fun um, dashboard. Um, so yeah, so that's the end of the end of the demo. Um, I'm writing a book, sort of like I guess going go into a bit more detail on yeah, kind of on what we what we talked about here. So if you with, with um, my friend Dunith, who works at uh, Red Pandas, if you're interested in that, it's on. Um, Safari already. Um, if you want to learn more about the Pinot side of things, we have a developer site, um, dev.startree.ai, and I make fun like sort of data data videos on random data stuff. Like, try attempting to keep it less than five minutes. So that's my uh, that's my goal. But otherwise, yeah, I guess we've got I've got 23 seconds left. <laughs> Who can get a question in in 23 seconds if you have one? Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, any questions?
Cool. Thank you. Thank you.